All right, thank you everyone so much for coming. Good evening. Um, thanks for coming out on this somewhat dreary night to learn about our new neighbor, the southern pine beetle. I am Dr. Emily Goldstein Murphy. I'm the research ecologist for the Nantucket Islands Land Bank. And my friend over here is Danielle O'Dell, who's the wildlife research ecologist for the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. And we've been thinking about southern pine beetle for several years now. And um, the time has really come to bring lots of attention to it as much as we can and get everyone up to speed on this for what this means for the future of our forests here on Nantucket. So this is the southern pine beetle. Its scientific name is Dendroctinus frontalis. This means tree killer. This, oops. This part of the um, Latin name means tree and then killer. So it is an obligate tree killer. When it goes into its hosts, um, it requires that they die in order for the reproductive cycle to proceed. These are tiny little blackish brownish beetles. They're the third of a size of a grain of rice. And I can't emphasize enough how small they actually are when you see them in real life. It's hard to gauge size when you're used to seeing these kind of zoomed in magnified pictures, but they are really very tiny in real life. They bore into the bark and they feed on the tree cambium, which is the tissue in between the bark and the wood of the tree where the nutrients go up and down from the roots to the needles. Um, and they are the most destructive forest pest in the southeastern United States, causing billions of dollars of losses to the timber industry. This is the geographic range of the beetle. They're mainly concentrated in the southeastern US, but they do extend west to Arizona and all the way south through Mexico down to Nicaragua, Nicaragua in southern, in Central America. Um, but they're not kind of uniform across the landscape. They're only where the pine trees are. And you can see that here. This is kind of where the pine forests are across the south. And the outbreaks happen non-uniformly. So some counties, these are all these square things, are hammered by these um, year after year after year, whereas there is no outbreaks in others. Mic. Sorry, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. I'll try to do this better. Um, their range is limited by cold winter temperatures. So three degrees is their lethal limit. So colder than that, three degrees Fahrenheit, and they will die. We don't see those temperatures too much up here anymore. So they are moving northward in their range. Um, and this has long been predicted by scientists who, knowing that the winters are becoming warmer, they're moving northward, they're getting into different species of pine forests. And if you think about what's north of here, New Hampshire, Maine, Canada, there is a lot of pine for them to expand into in the future. All right, so I told you these beetles live on host trees. How do they find their hosts? They um, are looking for stressed pine trees in which to begin their life cycle. And there are two theories on how the beetles find a host. The first is that they fly around looking for vertical objects, and then they'll land on one. If this is a stressed pine tree, great. They'll start boring into it. If it's not, they test it somehow, then they'll fly away and find something else. The other theory is that they are sensing chemicals in the air that come out of stressed pine trees, such as one that has been struck by lightning or otherwise injured. So these trees will release a smell into the air, the beetles can sense it, and they'll fly right to it and land on it. So after they go through the host tree selection process, they continue on with their life cycle, and the next phase is aggregation and boring. So the beetles aggregate on these trees because they release chemical pheromones into the air once they find a good tree that say to all the other beetles, come here, this is a great tree. They're basically releasing a chemical smell and this floats around, the other beetles can sense it and they fly right there. Generally, it's female beetles that find the trees first. Their aggregation pheromones then attract all other females and other males into that tree. This starts off an arms race with the tree because they have to get inside the bark, which is the tree's defense. So the beetles start chewing their way into the bark. They're kind of 
crawling through, they're digging out, they're pushing the sawdust out behind them, they're pushing the sap out behind them, and that creates these popcorn-style pitch tubes, which you can see right here. The tree, meanwhile, is trying to push the beetles out with the sap, so it's pushing more and more sap out through these holes. And in this case, you can see that the beetle was successfully pushed out by the tree. And this beetle isn't going to go on and reproduce. This beetle is done for. But you can see how much resources that takes from the tree to do this again and again and again and again. So when there's a mass attack on a tree, it can be very quickly overwhelmed. And that's the beetle strategy. That's why they're calling in all their friends to overwhelm the tree so they can get inside of it. Um, once they get inside, they start tunneling and will mate inside those tunnels and create these S-shaped galleries in which to put their eggs. You can see these curving tunnels, and you can see eggs off to the side and larvae. Um, when they're going through this process, the adults also inoculate the tunnels with two different types of fungus. One fungus is beneficial, and it helps the larvae feed on the cambium. The other fungus is called the blue stain fungus, which you can see kind of right here. It's pretty neutral to the beetles. It doesn't harm them, it doesn't help them, but it can damage the trees as well. It certainly damages the value of the timber. Okay, after the adults lay their eggs, they re-emerge from the tree. Um, they've either laid their full complement of eggs in the tree, or they, and they will re-emerge and kind of just participate out in the landscape, or they come out, find a new tree, and lay the rest of their eggs, so as you know, not to put them all in one basket, as it were. As the adults reemerge, the larvae continue to develop within the tree. A little bit more detail here. Um, this is a little tiny southern pine beetle egg. Imagine how small that is if the beetles are only so tiny. Um, their development is completely mediated by the temperature of the air. So at warmer temperatures, like 86 degrees Fahrenheit is their ideal temp. Um, their development happens very quickly at cooler temperatures down to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It happens much more slowly. So an egg will take between three and 34 days to hatch. It will hatch into a larva. You can see that there's four different stages or instars of larva. That can take between 15 to 40 days to go through that phase. Next is the pupa. This moves a little bit faster, 15 to 17 days. And then they become, it's called a callow adult. It's this light colored adult form that has to burrow out of the tree. It continues to feed at the stage before it burrows out. So this can take anywhere between a week or two before they come out and begin the cycle anew. So if you add up all those numbers, you can get a generation time of between 29 and 105 days. So in the south, where it's warm for most of the year, you can get between eight and nine generations of these beetles in a year. So you can imagine how quickly those populations can build into explosive numbers. Um, up here, where it's colder, maybe one, two, three generations a year. So that's something in our favor. It is their strategy to um, have pulses in reemergence and emergence of the young that allow for these coordinated mass attacks. And um, this allows them to breed most successfully and um, kill the trees as quickly as they can for their life cycle. This kind of results in irregular boom and bust population cycles across the years. So this goes all the way from 1960 to 2000, and it, you can see a really irregular kind of boom and bust cycles. There's nothing predictable about it. On the landscape in the south, these beetles are generally very rare um, over the whole area, and it's only the odd time when conditions or circumstances align that you will get these explosive eruptions of, um, you know, outbreaks and population growth. When these explosions happen, um, they just they continue until they burn out, until they've gone through all of the trees in the area and there's no trees left, or until they become themselves overwhelmed by predators. And this is the dubious checkered beetle. We actually have them here on Nantucket. Danielle has seen one. Um, so they are southern pine beetle predators, but it takes them a while to ramp up their own populations in response to a southern pine beetle outbreak. But they also cue in on the same pheromones as 
that the southern pine beetles are releasing. So that's how they find them. That's how they coordinate. Um, but now Danielle is going to talk about specific um, outbreaks, both in Long Island and here. Thank you, Emily. Can you guys hear me? Is this good? OK. All right, so Emily has told you how these beetles work. Let me show you what they're capable of. Um, I think you're going to find yourself a little bit horrified, which I think is kind of good, which we'll come back to. Um, so as Emily mentioned earlier, the extent of the range for southern pine beetles was throughout southeastern United States. But they, with warming temperatures, they're starting to m march northward. So the first major outbreak in the Northeast was on Long Island starting in 2014. And ever since, they have been dealing with um, periodic outbreaks um, pretty much on an annual basis now. So from central to eastern Long Island, um, hundreds of thousands of trees have died. They've been dealing with pop-up um, outbreaks of southern pine beetle ever since. And this map gives you an indication of just how extensive these beetles are and how quickly they can move. Um, they've been incredibly destructive. And unfortunately, Long Island has um, the, one of the largest expanses of pine barren habitat in the Northeast. So this has been pretty, pretty devastating for them. Luckily for us, it's meant that We've learned a lot from them. They have been really incredible about sharing all of their information, what they've learned, how to suppress an outbreak, how to deal with forest management, et cetera. So we've had a little bit of time um, to learn as much as we can, because it wasn't a matter of if they arrived here. It was certainly a matter of when they arrived here. So knowing all of that, um, most of the northeastern states really took this to heart and started monitoring for the presence of southern pine beetle pretty much right away. This is a picture of Nicole Kelleher, who um, is the Forest Health Program Director at the Department of Conservation and Recreation in Massachusetts. She's been overseeing the monitoring for southern pine beetle ever since 2015. And she's been setting these traps um, statewide wherever uh, we find pitch pine. Pitch pine tends to be a coastal species, so that's why we're seeing it mostly all of these little dots are where there have been traps for monitoring. Um, so mostly in southeastern uh, Massachusetts, but also a few pitch pine stands in the central part of the state as well. Um, so what we do is we set up these funnel traps, and they are baited with um, pheromone lures that are the same chemical composition as what the beetles themselves emit. So it is sending out this lure, and it's drawing beetles in, and it's also drawing in their predators. So we can keep an eye on when we start seeing an increase in the number of predators for southern pine beetles, then you kind of have a very good indication that there's actually a problem, because those predator numbers will build up over time. So we started sampling here in 2018, and as latest 2022, you can see that we really, you know, we were seeing some beetles the first few years, we were getting zero, one, you know, nothing to be concerned about. They're here, but not in huge numbers. In 2022, we started to see a slight uptick, but certainly nothing alarming, you know, 50 beetles over three traps, not, nothing too crazy. Um, and then these are the numbers statewide for all the traps in the entire state. Um, in 2022, the whole state started to see a slight uptick. 2023, again, a little bump. These are still not alarming numbers. They're certainly growing, but they're not nothing that would indicate an outbreak. But almost all of these beetles were found in traps on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. So another way that DCR has been monitoring um, statewide is by doing annual aerial surveys. And these are not just for, to look for southern pine beetles, but to look for other insect problems all across the state. And they systematically will survey tr these transects going back and forth, looking for indications of uh, problems with, with vegetation. Um, so just to give you an example of a shot from Nantucket, I believe this was in 2021. This doesn't show anything southern pine beetle related, but it does 
Um, this, is, this is all of uh, Tom Nevers East. This is the Milestone Cranberry Bog. And Nicole did give us an indication, like something's going on in the middle moors here. And you can see all of this grayed out area. This was taken in mid-June. This was all defoliated scrub oak due to um, another insect outbreak called the, the um, fall canker worm. Um, so that's finally burned itself out. But this is just to give you an example of what what kind of information we're getting from DCR from their aerial surveys. It's not a perfect way to detect insect problems. It's certainly like this past year, they had an indication that we might have a southern pine beetle problem, but they weren't super sure because if you can remember back to June, there was fog every single day. So weather can be um, an issue for doing aerial surveys. Locally, what we have been doing is we've been working with uh, Jacob Tinkhauser, who is from far-fetched Nantucket. He's been doing drone surveys for us over our pine forests because this is a great way to get you know, a, a bird's eye view of the whole entire forest. So you can see here, this is the West, West Gate site, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about soon. You can see some of these grayed out trees. These are dead trees. Um, and it, if you started seeing reddening needles or um, other indications of southern pine beetle, you might be able to pick that up with the naked eye, but not always. So we also have been collecting um, this infrared data with the exact same flight. Um, I'm not going to get into the technicality of it, but this technology gives you a way to see uh, declining health of vegetation before you can actually see it with your naked eye. So some of these, obviously these bright red um, areas are definitely where we're having some problems, but then some of the like peachy colored or lighter colored red, we can't see that with our eye in this, in this slide, but you can see it, um, look at the, at the NDVI. So we have many tools in our toolbox to uh, detect southern pine beetle. Ever since um, Long Island has started seeing southern pine beetle outbreaks, they, um, the North Atlantic Fire Exchange Program was sort of born out of that. They have been incredible, as I mentioned earlier, about sharing information. They've done in-person workshops, which we've been able to go down so we can actually go down and see what, you know, what we were expecting to eventually occur on Nantucket. Um, they've done a ton of webinars, multiple webinars per year, so they've been really, really proactive in getting out there and sharing information and getting people to understand what a problem this is, how to, f how to find it, how to identify it, and what to do. Um, out of that, we started our own Southern Pine Beetle Working Group on Nantucket, and it's, it's made up of a myriad of individuals, multiple organizations, several conservation organizations, um, Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, the DCR, uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation, and then landscapers, private individuals, um, Sheriff's Meadow Foundation is uh, also on, on Martha's Vineyard, so we're collaborating with our partners from the island. So this has all been a way for all of us to like get on the same page, make sure we're sharing information, figuring out resources so that we can all be monitoring our forests together. So it's super, super important for everybody to learn the signs of Southern Pine Beetle because we are going to be seeing this for the continuing future. Um, the most obvious sign of southern pine beetles are you'll have what appears to be a perfectly healthy tree, and then three weeks later, that tree looks like it's about to die. Um, so the whole crown, all of the needles will suddenly simultaneously turn red or brown or orange. So you had a healthy tree one day, and then a couple days later, um, the tree's not looking so good. And then if you get closer to the tree, you can see, um, Emily showed a much better picture earlier, but these little popcorn-shaped uh, pitched tubes in the bark where the tree is trying to defend itself. It's trying to push those beetles back out. Um, it can't, it's not always very, very obvious. Like sometimes you really have to get right up next to that tree. And the, the pitch tubes with southern pine beetle will be all the way up and down the entire length of the tree. Um, here's a little beetle that the tree successfully defended itself against, but unfortunately he had thousands of friends. Um, again, on the outside of the bark, you'll see these sort of shotgun splatter um, entry and exit holes, the little teeny tiny holes where the beetles have bored into or bored out of the tree. 
the S-shaped galleries where they've been boring in the back of the bark and then also in the actual tissue of the tree. And then oftentimes in a very, very active infestation where the tree is being completely overwhelmed, you actually have sawdust dripping, like floating through the air, just dripping off of the tree. So you can see that accumulating here at the base of the tree and all over the um, vegetation on, on the tree as well. We do have some um, lookalikes. Uh, the black turpentine beetle is very, very common here. Um, it, this is a southern pine beetle, and these are to scale. So this is a much, much bigger species of beetle. They, they bore much bigger holes into the tree that causes really, really huge globs of sap on the bottom of the tree that can sort of ooze all the way down. You'll never see that with southern pine beetle. And then the other biggest distinction is that um, black turpentine beetle only infests the bottom six to 10 feet of a, tr of a tree. So you're never gonna see it all the way up and down. It's just gonna be very, very obvious, like face level oozy sap. Um, very common, they do kill pitch pine trees occasionally, but they don't tend to outbreak or spread from tree to tree like a southern pine beetle does. Um, and then we have these other uh, beetles called Ips beetles that also infect um, pitch pine and Japanese black pine. Um, they're sim more similar size to a southern pine beetle, but they have very distinct galleries, um, or the, like the boring, the tunnels that they bore into the bark are more fan-shaped. Um, and then they have these kind of sticky dust balls on the outside of the bark versus like the sappy um, pitch tubes for the southern pine beetles. So, um, we hoped that we had a little bit more time before we saw an outbreak on Nantucket. We, just going on the numbers of beetles that we had seen in traps, we weren't quite expecting um, an outbreak as soon as we had one, but alas, it did happen, and we found the first outbreak in the state of Massachusetts here uh, on July 7th of this past summer. Um, this is at the Westgate entrance to Ram Pasture. It's kind of a funny little forest. It's about 14 acres of pitch pine trees that's surrounded by mostly wetlands, um, coastal heathlands and sand plain grasslands. It's relatively isolated. The nearest pine stand is about half a mile away. Um, so it's it's a extremely dense, like the understory of this forest was pretty much impenetrable, um, but uh, overstocked, kind of unhealthy forest to begin with, but we did have probably some of the oldest pitch pine trees on Nantucket in this forest, one that we estimated to be over 180 years old. Very, very sad to see that go. Um, for those that aren't familiar, this is right here. This is where Westgate is um, on the central western part of the island at the head of Clark's Cove or West Hummock Pond. And when I first found it, this is very telltale signs of southern pine beetle. So you can see some of these trees in the foreground are all dead already. And then in the background, you have these trees that have all the reddened, browned out needles that are in the process of dying, very active infestation. And these beetles were literally flying from tree to tree, sawdust all over the place. Um, so pretty classic indications. This is the same, a view of this exact same spot from above. So all the um, trees that had already died and then these trees here that were um, actively infested. We were not alone in any of this though. Uh, Martha's Vineyard uh, found an infestation about a week after we did. Um, there's probably had been going on for a little bit longer and was sort of flying under the radar. They have had multiple pop-ups across the island. I think they have five um, ongoing at this point and they're finding more and more trees all the time. Um, you can see all these trees in the background are dead. All these reddened out trees here are all infested now. And then here in the foreground is um, on the Sheriff's Meadow uh, Foundation property where they've actually done some suppression work. So the, all the trees that remain in here are all oak trees and everything that had been cleared out in this area was um, infested pitch pine. Major consideration for the Westgate site is that it's a known location for many maternity roosts for the northern long-eared bat. Northern long-eared bats are a federally endangered species that are essentially going extinct everywhere else throughout their range, but in these coastal areas, they seem to be persisting. We're not exactly sure why that is yet, but uh, we're, we're working on it. Um, 
we're hopeful that losing habitat isn't going to be a major problem for them. But where, where this comes into play here is that these, these bats, when they are raising their pups, they form maternity colonies of related female bats. So 10, 12, up to 20 female bats can all be raising their pups together in one tree. They absolutely love pitch pine. Um, these, oops. This is a, a dead pitch pine a snag tree that they roost underneath this little crack, but they'll also use live pitch pine that's covered in, they love it when it's covered in poison ivy, that's their very favorite. Um, or a broken old branch that came off that creates a little knot or a hole in the tree, they can get in there, they can raise their pups. So once you know that you have a maternity roost of northern long-eared bats, there is a cutting restriction um, in the vicinity of those trees during the whole entire pupping season. So 1 May through 31 July, you cannot cut. So we found this infestation on July 7th. Even if we had all our ducks in a row and were able to go ahead and cut the next day to begin the suppression activity, we wouldn't have been able to do so because we have to wait for the end of the maternity roost season. And that's because the pups can't fly. So the mothers um, the mothers can fly, they can leave, but their pups would, if we cut a tree, they would, they would die. Other management considerations for this site were that there were already a lot of dead and weakened trees due to infestation, so it's a safety hazard. A lot of old snag trees in this area just from old other storms. Um, and then the understory was incredibly dense and incredibly overgrown, which really created a safety problem for anyone working in those woods. So some of the hoops that we had to jump through, this is, all, this is the kind of stuff that we had to learn on the fly. This is a little bit stressful, but um, you had to have the entire site surveyed by a Massachusetts licensed forester. So um, we did hire Adam Moore from the vineyard who came over right away and um, marked every single tree with blue paint that was either actively infested or surrounding um, the, uh, in the buffer zone of a tree that was infested, infested. So any tree marked with blue paint had to be removed. Um, then he drafted a forest cutting plan for us, which then had to be approved by Natural Heritage, the DCR, and our local conservation commission. We then found out that we needed to have a licensed timber harvester on our staff, which is, seems weird because we're not actually harvesting the timber, but it was just something we had to do, so we did it. Um, we needed to avoid northern long-eared bat maternity roost season. And then our the big thing for us, we're a nonprofit, can we do this ourselves? Can Do we have the manpower? Do we have the equipment? Do we have the know-how? Do we have the money? Can we do this or do we have to hire a contractor? Doing nothing we knew was not an option. It was just like, how are we going to do this? Oh my God, our, our hand was forced. So in the initial survey that Adam Moore did for us, he marked 97 trees in this forest to be removed. Um, by the time we got all of our permits and all of our, we had made our decisions about how we were going to attack this, that had increased greatly. So we saw a huge spread of the beetles in, that, in the meantime. First step was to clear the understory of the forest, which um, improved sight lines, greatly improved safety, um, improved our access for our vehicles and for our equipment. It made it much easier for us to contemplate restoration post um, suppression um, because it allowed a lot more light down to the forest. Um, and then we, it made it easier for us to survey the additional trees that were infested. And just to back up for a second, we didn't make any of this stuff up. <laughs> we, these were all, we were following guidelines from DCR, from Mass Natural Heritage, and from everything that anyone who's ever worked with Southern Pine Beetle had ever learned before. So the best bet when you find an infestation is to try to tamp it down as soon as possible. So you have to, you know, you cut the trees, you slow that, the talk between the beetles, you slow the pheromone, um, talking between individual beetles and open up that forest and hopefully at least give us a chance to get on top of things before it spreads to our neighbors. I mean, we could have just said, this is out of our hands, we can't do this, but that's, they certainly would have then spread to more NCF property, more land bank property, more private property all across the island. I mean, anywhere we have pitch pine, we're susceptible now. So we felt that we, want, we needed to do it for us, but we needed to do it 
to be neighborly as well. Um, so all the trees that were infested had to be cut as well as buffer trees. We continued to survey and by the end of all of the work that we did, we had felled 220 trees. And now we're dealing with, um, still, we're still dealing with cleanup of all of this. So all of the slash, all of the needles, all the branches had to be chipped up, and all of the logs uh, needed to be um, piled and now uh, chipped and removed from the site. So we're, we're still working on all of that now. This picture still makes me sick to look at, and I, I hope that it's an impactful um, view of this forest. Um, it's not all bad. It's, it, it looks uh, intense, it looks devastating, and it should. I mean, this is what could happen in other places, but it also, we also know now that not doing any forest management ahead of time is what got us into this situation. So all of us on Nantucket, we've always been reluctant to do forest management here. We've been very hands off, but it's created these very unhealthy, overstocked, dense forests that just aren't, they're not able to withstand an attack on their own. So this allows us um, some potential for restoration. All of this bare ground now, all it's getting all of the sunlight. We should, um, the seed bank in the soil is, um, it's all still there and it should respond to opening up, being exposed, um, and we should see some great regeneration of some very desirable species in come the summer. We're also collecting pine cones, and um, my colleague Kelly Omond is is right now baking pine cones to get them to open up so we can collect the seed and, and hopefully grow some more pitch pine. Um, so we're gonna bop back and forth again here. Emily's gonna come back and tell you, but um, we wanna talk now about the you, can, you have two options, really. You can proactively manage your forests, or you can wait for this to happen and then suppress. And I can, I can tell you for sure that suppression is not the way to go for every single instance. It's incredibly destructive, it's intense, it's stressful, not just emotionally, but physically stressful. It's very expensive, um, and it doesn't address the root cause of the problem in the first place. So. Um, we're hopeful that we have now some management tools that'll help us create some more resilient forests um, that are going to better be able to withstand a southern pine beetle attack in the future. And Emily's going to talk to you about what the land bank is doing about that. All right. Thanks, Danielle. Um, those are some really powerful pictures that she showed, wasn't it? Um, it's a lot. But what can we do to try to avoid this happening in other pitch pine forests on Nantucket? Um, wouldn't it be great if there were tools in our toolbox to work to get ahead of the um, outbreaks that we know are coming for us? So um, building on the experience from forest researchers in the south and those working on Long Island, they have developed ways to proactively manage the forests to make them more resilient for southern pine beetle outbreaks. And basically this is thinning the forest to get more airflow running through the trees, um, breaking up that pheromone communication, making it so the beetles can't call in their friends and build into these explosive populations that just outbreak and outbreak and outbreak. Um, by thinning the trees, you also reduce their internal competition with their neighbors. So the trees that remain are healthier and are better able to pitch out the beetles. They're better able to resist the attacks of the beetles. Um, this also is not cheap. It's perhaps maybe less um, expensive than a suppression because you can plan for it. You can um, go at your own pace somewhat. It's not reactive, but it's definitely not um, pocket change. So um, when this all started um, learning about it, we are basically running off of two plans. We're running off of the New York State Southern Pine Beetle Management Plan, which has recommendations on how to thin the forests, and also this paper um, by Elizabeth Jameson, which, where she developed a hazard rating tool that tells you, um, once you know about your forest, how at risk is it of outbreak um, from southern pine beetle. 
So the recommendation from these two documents is to thin the forest to 60 to 80 square feet per acre of basal area. So we read this and said, well, what does that mean? Um, none of us are foresters. We're not Massachusetts licensed foresters. None of us went uh, you know, to forestry science college. Like This is not what we knew starting this off. Um, but you, know, you do your research, you do your reading, and you talk to people. The NAFC uh, workshops have been so helpful in this. And talking with people who have been through it, we learned um, what basal area actually is. And to explain it briefly, it's if you look at the tree four and a half feet from the ground, this is called breast height on most people, it's a little bit higher on um, myself and Danielle, but four and a half feet up um, is breast height on a tree. And if you take a cross section there, you can take the area of that circle and that that is the basal area of the tree. So basically it's the the footprint of the trunk of the tree looking down on it. Um, and if you add all of that up over an acre, you get a number that's in square feet. So if that adds up to about 60 to 80 square feet, that is ideal. If your forest is denser than that, you know it's more at risk of southern pine beetle because it's, it's too dense. So um, we still didn't know what basal area we had out on the properties, so we had some work to do. The first part of that was figuring out where, in fact, our southern, or sorry, where our pitch pine forests were um, that we wanted to focus on. So the land bank chose four major pitch pine properties to focus our work on. We have Gardner Farm, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, Maya Comet Woods down here off of Maya Comet Ave. Hinsdale, which is um, just to the north of the Discovery Playground. And here we have a large complex of pitch pine forests um, north of Milestone Road and kind of south of Pulpis. So lots of land out here. And we're calling this complex Milestone Corridor. So lots of land bank property that we had to think about protecting from the southern pine beetle if we could at all. So over the past couple years, the environmental field team has been doing forest uh, plots, we call them, um, where we take um, all of, it's called DBH, diameter at breast height of all of the pitch pine trees in a fifth of an acre plot. So um, we have these DBH tapes, you kind of wrap it around and it can measure the diameter of the tree for you. Through that, you can calculate that basal area and if you multiply it by five, you get the basal area for a whole acre. Um, so we did, I think, almost 30 plots in Gardner Farm and it's probably hard to see the numbers, but this lightest color blue is are the only ones that are in that 60 to 80 square foot per acre range. Anything darker than that is much denser. Going all the way up to this darkest blue, which you see here, is upwards of 150 square feet per acre. Um, so almost twice as dense as we would like to see. Um, you can see it also maybe more clearly on this hazard rating map over here. So going back to that Jameson paper, we plugged those numbers into her equation and anything that is dark red is at very high risk of southern pine beetle outbreak. So just a few yellows and oranges and a lot of reds across, especially over here. So we knew we had our work cut out for us um, if we wanted to be proactive about this management. So we needed to bring in some expert advice. We talked to DCR and applied to a cost share grant program to get support in paying for a forester to develop these forest stewardship plans, which are a DCR product that tells you, you know, how best to take care of your forests, how to manage them over the next 10 years. It's a 10 year plan. So we were fortunate to engage Adam Moore, who um, worked with Danielle and the rest of NCF at the Westgate outbreak. We actually got Adam to work with us in, I think, May or June we started talking with him. So he, he was already kind of up on what was happening on Nantucket by the time Danielle found the outbreak at Westgate. So it was very easy for him to transition over. 
and work there. Um, he came out in November to do the field work to write our plans. He's also the president of Sheriff's Meadow Foundation over on Nantucket, which is a large landowning conservation organization. So he's not only a licensed forester, but he's very much in the conservation nonprofit um, sphere of work. So it's a really great fit for all of us to work with him. And I think Danielle would agree he's been an excellent human being to work with on this project. Um, so anyway, he produced four forest management stewardship plans for us and for each of those four properties. And during the same time as he was writing these, we were working internally on a habitat management plan for a gardener farm. And this is going through Natural Heritage, which is kind of the state biologist office that looks after the habitat for rare species. We have a lot of rare species on Nantucket, so any work you want to do in their habitat, you have to get permitted and approved through Natural Heritage at the very least. So we uh, were working with them and their biologists to get advice on how best to work this so that we can um, get a better, more resilient forest. Um, to be resilient against southern pine beetle, but also the best outcome for the other rare species that are out there. It was through this process that we realized this aligns many of our management priorities. So this is a picture of Gardner Farm. Um, you can see that it is dense, it's overcrowded, it's dark. Um, there is a lot of dead wood on the ground and dead branches going up the trees. This is dangerous. Um, this is a fire risk. There's a lot of fuel here. Um, there is not a great understory. It's not very diverse. Um, there should be a lush understory providing um, host plants for moth species that in turn provide food for birds and, and the bats. So we would like to see the habitat moving towards something more like this. This is a, a picture of a pine barrens habitat. You can see there are still quite a few mature trees in this image, um, but it's more open. There's airflow. There's sunlight hitting the forest floor. There's a lush, diverse understory. It's really quite beautiful. And this in its turn is a rare habitat as well. So this is our goal. Um, and really, it brings all of these things into alignment. So. Um, we have the fire risk, fuel reduction, we have the pine barrens habitat restoration, and of course, the thing that's given us the push to do all this is um, working towards southern pine beetle resilience. So we end up with a resilient forest that is ecologically, um, it's got ecological integrity. Um, so even if we weren't doing this, this for the southern pine beetle, this is good work to be doing. Um, so in a way, it's, it was great to get this nudge to start forest management. Um, but again, if only we had more time to get more done. So um, you, we can't do this quickly. It's, it's a lot of work. We have our 10-year plans from Adam, the forester, now. So um, I'll sh just show you briefly how he's kind of staged this out. Maya Comet Woods is on target for next year, all going well. Um, also starting in Hinsdale, staged over a few years, and there is a lot of work out in Milestone Corridor. This is staged all the way out until 2031, but in the next 10 years, we hope to have a lot of this forest management done um, if we're lucky enough to have the chance to do that without outbreaks coming in the meantime that we have to respond to that won't give us the chance to do this. Um, but also Gardner um, has four units, the first of which is over here that we have already started as of the beginning of this year. And I'm delighted to share some photos of our management with you. This is a publicly used property, so we have a trail growing through it. We did have to close the trails, so there are several trail closure signs um, where people could enter the property. We just have to keep people out for safety during the active phase of work. Um, we're also leaving a undisturbed um, buffer of understory next to the neighboring development just to keep things a little calmer. Um, and I am honored and humbled to introduce you to our in-house forest management crew. Um, we have Rico, Tom, Guthrie, and Jeff, and not pictured as Rob. And these are all full-time land bank staff. To date, all of the work on the property has been completely in-house. 
Um, and it is a joy to work with these people. They are so professional and so safety conscious, and they make this very difficult and dangerous work look easy. Um, it, it's amazing to see. So, you know, they've got their chainsaws, they have this nifty machine, and they are just getting it done. Um, and it's, it's great to work with them as part of the team. So now I get to show you the cool pictures of the work that they've actually done. As Danielle said, the first step is always understory clearing. This is the Landbank's Bobcat Masticator. It's a pretty fearsome little machine. It has 40 blade teeth down here, and it can basically chew through all this understory in a matter of minutes. Um, if you're trying to do this by hand, you just you basically just couldn't. It takes machinery like this to do it. Um, and this is what it leaves behind. You might say this is pretty roughed up and not nice looking, but this is actually ideal. This is what we want to see. This is what the biologists in natural heritage are recommending that we do um, to expose as much of the mineral soil as we can, get rid of the many, many years and layers of, of forest detritus that's on the ground to let the natural seed bank come through as soon as sunlight hits the forest floor. And that's what we're getting. So even without many trees coming down yet in this picture, you can see we're getting a lot more sunlight onto the floor. And it's just, you know, we're really hopeful that it'll come back quite nicely very, very soon. So once we had the understory cleared out, we were able to bring Adam back to help us uh, learn how to mark trees, choose which ones to cull, how many had to go, which ones were best to stay. Again, he uses his famous blue paint, which is most definitely not washable <laughs> from our clothes, we learned. Um, he also, oops, he gave us a better way to measure the DBH, that diameter at breast height of the trees. These are forest calipers, much easier than running a DBH tape around. Um, and this is what it looked like after we'd been through on our tree marking day. All of, again, all of the blue painted trees are the ones that will be culled, the ones that aren't painted stay. And every tree that we culled, we measured and made a tally of it. So we know exactly how much timber is going to be coming out of this forestry unit. And we'll report this up to the state when we make our final report. Um, now, hopefully this works. This is a time-lapse video of the work on the ground. It's pretty quick, so I might um, try to play it another time. But here you can see the trees being dragged into the chipping um, operation area, and this tree dragging work is something that has been recommended from New York, from all the um, Massachusetts biologists. This really helps us. Let's see, can I get it to play again? This helps us to rough up that soil as much as possible and get uh, you know it exposed to the air, light down into it, and basically we're raking the forest with the trees. And I just love watching these time-lapse videos. It's fun. <laughs> it is a lot of work. This is one afternoon's work. Sorry for the sound on that, but it, it's big, it's heavy, loud work. Um, but you can really see how raking the tree through the um, through that soil, the duff layer, will rough it up. And we're doing that as much as possible as was recommended to us. Now, community involvement. This has been one of our goals from the start of this project. We want the community to know um, first about the risks of southern pine beetles. So. Um, they know what to do, but also that this is public land that we're doing this on. This is land owned by the land bank for the enjoyment of the people on Nantucket. And it's important that people know what we're doing, that we're being good stewards of the land. Um, same for the Conservation Foundation, same goals there. So both of our organizations have been doing outreach articles and videos through the course of this. Um, we've been, both been doing guided walks. Um, of the fall and winter this past year. 
And um, now with this forestry work, we are offering um, products from the trees free to the community. Um, so mainly in the form of chips, but also tree trunks if they want. We've offered them directly to farmers and nonprofits in the community. This is ongoing. Um, this is a picture of wood chips at my grandfather's farm right around the corner from Gardner Farm. So a great place to deliver it. But we, um, if people want to get in on the list for free wood chips or whatever, please, please let us know. I'll have a email for you later on at the next slide um, to sign up. But we want to be respectful to this forest with um, the products that are coming out of it. So we don't want to see it go to waste. We want use to come if possible. And other ways to get involved. If you see something out there, please say something. If you think you see these reddened or dying trees that you don't expect to see, or you drive by one week and it's fine, the next week it's really not looking good, please report it. We have a website um, hosted by the Conservation Foundation. You'll see it down here. It's on the next slide as well. SPB at NantucketConservation.org. Um, they monitor it and share it out to whoever is nearest, and someone will come look if um, it seems like something that is suspect. So this is a, picture, a slide that you may want to take a picture of once I have everything up, um, especially if you have pitch pines or other forest on your property or nearby. So this is the information from DCR about the forest stewardship plans. You can find anything you need to know about it at this website, and you can get in contact with the district service forester. His name is James Rassman, really nice guy who can give plenty of free advice about any forestry-related question, really. This is where you will find the list of private consulting licensed foresters of Massachusetts. There are several hundred of them, so plenty to choose from if you're looking for a forester to write one of these plans or just to consult with about the trees on your property. Again, here is that website that I spoke about on the last side slide. Um, and if you want um, forestry products, please let Emma know. She's on our staff. Um, you, her email address is right there, so shoot her a line if you want to get on the list. We can't necessarily promise anything, but it, you know, we'll get you on the list, and there's a lot of work coming up in the next several years, so there will be something at some point. I just want to end on a positive slide with reasons for hope for the future um, and emphasize that Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard are leading the way in the state in response to southern pine beetle, both in um, outbreak response and in preventive work. So we should be proud to be at the forefront of this. We're really learning as we go through it, but people are watching and learning from us as well. As I said previously, this decreases our fire risk in the habitats, it increases the resilience, and it restores a very valuable habitat type, the Pine Barrens, which is home for many rare moths, rare birds, and of course, the northern long-eared bat. So it's um, a lot of work. It's physical, it's dangerous, um, it's responsive, but also proactive. So um, it, it's going to look different in the future, but we're, we're excited, too, to see what the change will bring. So with that, um, we both just want to thank all of you for coming out tonight, but also especially to our Southern Pine Working Group partners, um, the other conservation organizations, the landscape professionals who have forest capabilities, um, the state organizations, and Sheriff's Meadow. Um, they're, we're all listed here. And um, yeah, we'd be delighted to take any questions. <laughs> Oh, hi. I was just curious about moving the shavings around and the pine bark beetle. Isn't that going to move them around? That is a very valid concern. So for our work that we're doing in Gardner Farm, there is no infestation there. There are no southern pine beetles in that unit. This is purely preventive thinning. So 
these pine shavings and chips are as good as any other pine shavings or chip. There's, there's nothing in them. But we also explored this question with Nicole Kelleher, the forest health specialist for DCR, and she said it's really not a huge concern of hers. Once the tree goes to the chipper, there is not much that's going to survive that. So especially if you let it dry out for a couple of weeks, to not be too concerned about even using infested tree chips. Not sure how comfortable I feel about that, but she's the expert on that one. So, but the chips that we're producing right now, no southern pine beetle in it. The chips that we are going to be the the chips that are going to be coming from Westgate are going to be removed and taken to the to the dump. So we're not going to be. I mean, even though. It's just sort of out of an abundance of caution to, to get rid of those chips and make sure we're not spreading them anywhere else. Although we have been assured that nothing is going to survive a chipper, but they're, they're really tiny. These beetles are really tiny. <laughs> yep. um, have you had any contact with the, guy, the people who run the state forests? Because both of the state forests have looked like nobody's been in them for years. Yeah, uh, so the DCR, Department of Conservation and Recreation, is in charge of those forests, and they are, actually, I'm pretty sure one of their crews is coming down very soon to do some surveying work for there. So they, we don't see a lot out of them, but they have been on island, and they are paying very close attention to what's going on. So I'm not sure what their plan is um, in terms of management, but they are paying attention. Nothing else? All right, I think that means we did a really good job. <laughs> <laughs>